This is a Pinball News production. Well, it's really my pleasure to be here. Uh, and I don't know what the hell is with this microphone, so I'll try to stay away from it. I feel like I'm on a ship. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, you know, you'll have to suffer with me today because I'll be giving this presentation in English. <coughs> the only language I know, barely. Growing up in Brooklyn, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't always, uh, <laughs> It wasn't always spoken in the King's English. It's a lot of slang. Um, who's here for the first time at this show? I'm curious. Good. Uh, that's, that's a lot. Because I haven't been here for 10 years. Um, and I'm really sorry. You know, the organizers of the show, they do a really great job. And I tell you what, I was at Pinball Expo, what was it, a couple weeks ago? Two weeks. I don't think the show, I don't think Pinball Expo has anything on this show. I think this is a great venue. I love that you have food and drink right in with the games. I love that the room has carpet. I think Rob Burke, uh, if you listen to Rob and you watch the video of this, come check the show out, see what they're doing. Maybe you'll find out some secrets that you can use. I think it's great. So um, listening to JP and Olaf, I was kind of saying to myself, what did I create when I put a screen into a game? And what did I create? You know, I, I knew that it was going to be more involved. I knew there was going to be more assets that you needed from licensed people and more work that has to be done, more choreography. But I felt that's what Pinball needed. It needed to be brought into the 21st century, kicking and screaming. And I did what I did. Who could, who could read that for me and translate it, what it means? Yes. Yeah. It, it says, uh, it's a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, it says, don't go where the path leads you, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. Yes. Everybody hear that? Okay, good. That's what, that's what my thought process was when I started Jersey Jack Pinball. So, the other day I said, what am I going to do with the seminar? I don't want to do the usual, you know, talk about whatever. I try to always change it up. Um, I picked a bunch of pictures and I threw them into a PowerPoint and put it on my iPad. And um, it's kind of a little bit of a story about my life and my fun time that I've had with pitball. So here I am in 1971, I'm a 14 year old kid and I'm on CB radio. Anybody know what CB radio is? Changing. Mm. No, oh, yes. Okay, so that's social media. All right, that was the social media of the 70s, was CB radio. Really? Yeah. Okay, well, let's see what happened here. What, it, was, it was doing this before, too, right? It wasn't fun. Thanks for telling me that. I would have gone through the whole presentation. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's a little different. So there I am. Uh, and, and the radio, if anybody notices, it's open. The cover is off of it because I was into electronics and, and I got in with a bunch of friends that I met through CV and we'd walk around Brooklyn in the neighborhood and pick up TVs and stereos and all kinds of radios and then build things out of them. Uh, and I got knocked on my ass you know, more than one time. So there's probably some brain damage or whatever from uh, experimenting with electronics, but it was a lot of fun. And I actually met my wife through CV, my, one of my friends, Russ, he was going out with a girl named Jill, and her best friend was Joanne. And I met her when I was 15, and we started going out when we were 19, and we married 41 years. So I owe that to CB too, I guess. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the guy that hired me in the industry. It's his fault that I'm here. So uh, his name was Heinz Magdalinski. He was an old German guy, okay, I'll say that. I was 17, and he was all of like 45. So he was old, and um, I went on an interview. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I wanted to take six months off before I went to college for electrical engineering. I, I, that was my plan, and my electronics teacher told me, "Don't go to work because you're never going to go back to school." 
And I said, no, that's not true. Well, that's true. <coughs> well he was right. Heinz, uh, let me take a civil war. I went on an interview in New York City, and Heinz interviewed me, and he asked me really important questions like, you know how to sodom? Yeah. You know how to eat a schematic? Yeah. Okay, I like you, you're hired. <laughs> and the first day that we worked together, um, the company had the company had arcades in all the major colleges and universities in the New York City metropolitan area. So it was kind of weird. I'm supposed to be in college, but I'm going to college, going to Columbia University, and see them post New York Tech, LIU, Brooklyn College, and I'm fixing games. And I met some of my friends in school. And they're like, what the hell are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm fixing pinball machines. Really? So the first day Heinz was together, he was taking me back to the train, and the next day I was getting my company caught. And he said, um, all right, I'll take you to the train, I'll see you tomorrow. And it was like 5 o'clock, and he says, no, where are you going? What else do you have to do? Oh, I gotta go here, I gotta go there. I said, well, let's go. No, no, you work till 5 o'clock. I said, no, I don't work till 5 o'clock, I work till the job is done. He looked over the glasses at me. He must have thought, I can't imagine what he thought. He said, this guy's either the greatest thing in the world or he's just stupid. I wanted to learn. I live with my parents. I was single, right? What am I going home for? I'm going to do this. And the first time Heinz opened a pinball machine that day, it was an EM. I don't remember the game. It was probably like a high low ace or something like that. And I saw all those relays and all the motors and everything. I wanted to cry. I had the same feeling when my mom left me in kindergarten and all the kids were crying in class and I said, I'm not going to cry. And when he opened the game, I just looked at it like it was nothing. You know, and uh, kind of funny. One other Heinz story I'll just tell you. As I got better doing it, there were two other people that were pinball mechanics working for the company. And they let them go because I guess I picked up the slack. And I was working. I would go to work early and I would come home late and I would do a lot. I would do preventative maintenance and things like that. So, that did advance. There you go. So here's me on a Saturday in 1975 at CW Post College, which is in Long Island. And uh, there, was a, there was a school, uh, they were doing a story about something in school and the school photographer took some pictures of me. And, uh, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at when I'm working on this card list. But, um, and I was really proud of my tool case. You know, I was getting paid maybe 200 bucks a week in 1975 money. When they let the other two people go in the company, I got $25. I thought that was the best thing in the world. I'm like, wow, I got an extra 25 bucks with that. But um, I spent maybe, I want to say about $300 on this tool case. And it was made by Jensen. They're still in business, and I still have multiple tool cases over the years. They're indestructible. And what the tool case did for me was it organized me, and it helped me, um, it helped me do my job better. Because if anything you do, I, I had a shop teacher in electronics that always said, Mr. Soutain, the proper tool for the proper job. So you know, if you don't have tools, you, you're not able to perform. Um, here's a couple more pictures. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes my daughter Jen finds these things, and I don't know how the hell she finds them. But there I am at a, at a show, AMOA, Amusement Music Operators of America, 1977. That was at the Conrad Hilton Hotel in Chicago, where thousands of people were congregating. You couldn't walk in those shows. And if anybody notices what's behind me, yeah. I should have probably taken the picture with Bigfoot. I don't know where that game went. So here it is, the height of, uh, you know, I'm living in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, I remember I grew up in Brooklyn, even though I'm Jersey Jack. There I am on a New Year's Eve party, leaning on a pinball machine, and that's, that's become a bar stool, that's become all kinds of artwork and all over the place. Who knew? I probably weighed 120 pounds then. I weigh 160 pounds now, so. Picture me 40 pounds less in polyester. And a little bit more hair and a wacky mustache. And uh, the other picture of me is interestingly Easter of 1977. 
Saturday Night Fever, the movie, didn't come out until November of that year. So I don't know who John Travolta took a style from. <laughs> this is Steve Shulman. Steve was the owner, his, his uncle owned the first company I worked for, Jeffco Amusements. And Steve was one of the people that interviewed me before Heinz interviewed me. And Steve <coughs> just retired from the industry. I've been friends with him all these years. Um, and it's, it's, it's always good. I, I try not to ever burn a bridge with anybody. If the relationship didn't go perfectly, you know, it's two sides of the story. But Steve's a great guy and I still talk to him. So along comes January 1st, 2011, and for about a year I was thinking of starting a pinball company. I, was, I had pinballsales.com. I was Stern's biggest distributor for a while. I sold thousands of Stern pinball machines. I think they're great, you know, they were great when I sold them. But, you know, when we were in a recession, it started about 2008, and sales were down. And a lot of people thought sales were down because people didn't have money. But pinballsales.com has a trademark saying. The saying is, we sell everything nobody needs. That's what you guys buy. Pinball machines. God bless you all. <laughs> um, so I said to myself, you know what? It's, it's not about that there's no money. It's about the games aren't keeping up with the times. <laughs> okay, if anybody's sleeping, now hopefully you're okay. <laughs> So when I announced this uh, on the first day of January 2011, some people went nuts. I mean, Jason Roofer got a tattoo. You know, I don't have a Jersey Jack tattoo, okay? And I'm not getting a Jersey Jack tattoo. So I hired some really great people that were industry um, seasoned people. Look, at the time I was doing it about uh, 35 years I was in the industry at that time. So I knew enough to know that I really didn't want a pinball factory. It was not a dream, it was not on a bucket list. I remember being in the factory with Gary Stern at 10 o'clock at night, picking up nuts and bolts and throwing them back into a bin. It's, it's a crazy, year. how many people here own a pinball company? Yeah. No? Well, you know, there's still time, you know. Everybody's got a pinball company. So, making it real, the lines and circles that our designer drew, they become whitewood, as you saw some pictures before. And Wizard of Oz was one of those games where I haven't talked about it in public for years and years now. But looking back at it, I knew at the time it was going to change the world. And now, 13 years later, whatever it is, it did change the world. It did change the pinball world. Uh, whenever we wanted to put something in the game, I just said, yes, let's put it in the game. And Nolan Bushnell, who's a friend, everybody knows Nolan, right? Started Atari, started Chuck E. Cheese, brilliant guy. He has a law, it's, it's a law in quotes, and it is, all the best games are easy to learn and difficult to master. They should reward the first quarter and the hundredth. And that was based on his experience with computer space, a game that was created, he was involved in creating. He had Pong that he put in a bar and it went out of order because it filled up with money. I mean, that's a problem to have. So we still work today on the philosophy of Nolan Bushnell. I don't want you going up to a Jersey Jack game and being frustrated when you put your money in and you say, this game's too hard, God bless you. This game's too hard, I'm not gonna play it again. I'd rather you uh, learn it, be able to learn it. And some of them are intimidating. Well, let's face it. You go up to pirates, I don't know what they'll do. I gotta pick a character, I gotta do <laughs> the things yelling at me and all that stuff. <laughs> but you know, it's a great game. It's a great game and it's different. So in the beginning, I, I hired people that I believe that they were very talented. You'll see Chris Graner doing sound, Keith Johnson software. Greg Ferris, artwork, Dennis Norman on design, and Matt Reister. Matt, this guy here, he was a customer who was working in a different industry, and he told me he could sculpt things and everything like that, and I said, sure, go ahead, do it, you know? 
I believe Greg didn't have a job at the time in Pinball. Chris Grander was not working in Pinball. Keith Johnson was working for a company other than a Pinball company doing software. And that was doing like something else altogether, not in this. So in the course of all these years of having Jersey Jack Pinball, I can't even count the amount of people that are involved directly, indirectly, um, but it's 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 great to see it's great to see things grow. March of 2011, we had a design meeting, the first time the team from all over could get together. It was actually at a hotel in uh, in uh, Schaumburg, Chicago, and we didn't have we didn't have backlit lighting to see the so they hung the they hung the drawings on the window and reviewed them. Okay. So you know you make you make do what you have, and and we and we did. The RGB LEDs. A lot of people didn't understand this when I went to go get the inserts for the play fields. Um, the guy that made the inserts told me, "Well, on the shelf I have yellow stars and green arrows and red circles, and use those things and put them in your game. I'll charge you less." And I said to this guy, Steve, I said, uh, they're all going to be clear. What are you, stupid? All the lights on your game are going to be white lights? Like, what kind of game are you making? No, I'm using RGB LED. What is that? People didn't know. But there's 139 RGB LEDs on Wizard of Oz. 139. Keep that number in mind. King Bright LEDs at the time were $2.65 each. You needed one Allegro controller chip to, to drive one RGB LED. It was a dollar each. About 600 bucks a game, just for the lighting in Wizard of Oz. So 139 RGB LEDs in Wizard of Oz. You got how many, how many in Elton John? 1,600. Come a long way. And I think, I'm not exactly sure, don't quote me on it, but I think the RGB LEDs are about 70 cents each now. So that's what happened, there's a thing called Moore's Law. And over time, things get less expensive. Wizard of Oz had a topper, which wasn't really a big deal. It was a light strip, and it was some edge plastic, but it was the first topper in 15 years in South Park. Anybody see any toppers on pinball machines lately? Yeah. So we, we actually revived the idea of having a topper. And I can't even I can't, I can't keep up with all the mods for pinball machines these days. Lighting and cup holders and somebody's got a helicopter blade makes the game fly around the room. So <laughs> This was a design team at Pinball Expo in 2011. And um, they, they bought into my dream and they helped make it come true. Uh, the interesting thing about getting vendors for pinball, you know, you see companies today and they announce a game and then they can't build the game or they can't ship the game. Does anybody know what the most important part of a pinball machine is? Come on. The part you're missing. The part you're missing. That's the most important part of the game. So when you look at these whiteboards that I had made, we had a company and what the hell do I know? You know, you vet these companies, they say they're going to be able to make it, the guy's punching out all kinds of stuff for everybody else. Yeah, sure, you, you might have been to do light boards. Well, let's say there's 10 light boards in the game. The guy made like 500 of number one and 200 of number two. What am I supposed to do with that? I can't do anything until I have sets. You got to make a set. So when they set up a machine, they set it up for one board and then they run that one board. So when he told me I was getting light boards like in April, I think the light boards still the following January. How would you like that? How did that carry the company through that? Not fun. And then these are, these are fixtures that we had to figure out how to make them to hold the work that you're doing. This is a, for a was up a play field and the play field would snap in there and you'd be able to turn it upside down and work on it and everything like that. You can't just work on it with your hands like that. You have to have all kinds of fixtures 
when you send them to factory. So we set up the factory first in Lakewood, New Jersey. It was a great building. Uh, I paid the landlord a whole year's rent in advance. So I got rid of him, I got a big discount. And um, anybody could visit us. This happens to be Joe Newhart, longtime customer of pinballsales.com, and he owns Pinball Star. He's one of our distributors today. You know, does anybody know what's missing from the play fields, by the way? See any light boards on the play field? No, no. Joe, Joe was wondering if I was still alive and you know, I was running a Ponzi scheme or something like that, or he didn't admit that to years later, but he just wanted to come to the building to see what was going on. You know, here's what's going on, and here's the truth, and here's what we're waiting for, and welcome to making pinball machines. And then there's a picture of me on the first day that we punched out like a dozen games. And um, me looking at that picture right now, I'm really happy, really happy. You know, if you don't go through some difficult times, and we all go through some difficult times in our lives, you know, people will say, well, that builds character, you know, or you, you rise up to a challenge and it makes you stronger. It's, it's crappy going through it, but when you get through it, you feel that like you could knock down a building if you wanted to. So we went and knocked down a building. This is uh, IAPA, which is November of 2012. Superstorm Sandy hit New Jersey a few days before as we were building these games. We had eight games at the show in Orlando, and we had power in half of the building. And the building didn't get flooded, but I had people that came to work and built those games when their own homes were flooded and they didn't have power. We have amazing people over the years that I worked for Jersey Jack Pimple. I just gave the blood, sweat, everything. So we went to the show, and you could see Keith, Keith is knocked out. <laughs> That's my dad and my daughter playing the game. There's Roger Sharp, and there's me and Jen. She ordered this yellow brick road carpet for the booth. And we won a brass ring award. Best new product. That doesn't happen to a pinball machine in my industry. The other side of my industry. This is my consumer side of my life. That's the commercial side of my life. Pinball doesn't get one. And I don't want to say that um, it wasn't appreciated. We really appreciated it. You know? And most of my family was there. My wife, my nieces, my, my sister, my cousins. So. Everybody celebrated. It was a great reaction. Here we are at the first pinball expo that we went to in 2013. Where's JP? Is he still here? Look at this guy. What were you, 15? <laughs> and Keith, God bless him. Keith to the end. He's, he's at the show programming. I got him a bag of popcorn, and I wrote, do not disturb genius at work. No <laughs> lie. Yeah, I know. I mean, the dedication that the people in the company had to make things happen was just amazing. Just amazing. Gerard's not here, right? He's probably out wearing his Pac-Man suit somewhere, right? Okay. Well, he was there from the beginning. And everywhere we went with the game, we got an amazing response. This is the comic show. This is the comic book show. Comic Con in New York City. Uh, same year, 2013. I mean, literally thousands of people. This was like showing somebody fire for the first time with a wheel. They looked at it and they just couldn't believe what they were looking at, whether they knew pinball or not. And everywhere we went, Martin will tell you because he took all the pictures, Rooms were packed with people. It was it was crazy. You know, I said to somebody today, I was talking about, you know, a little bit of this, looking back a little bit, and I said, I just wanted to make games. I oversimplified everything to myself, and I think 
entrepreneurs and people that create things do that to themselves. They convince themselves. I had to sell myself on this idea first and believe in it. But I didn't expect all the other things that went with it. I just thought we were going to make games in a vacuum and that's not how it works. But it's been great. One, there you are. Was that you? That's not you. That's the answer. I don't know where you are. But Martin was everywhere, and I tell you, Martin, you're just amazing doing all these seminars and all the time you spend and everything, chronicling history. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, with that notoriety, came a magazine cover on Replay Magazine, our industry magazine, in January of 2013. But it's not just it's not just a monthly magazine, and I write for it. I've been writing for it. I have a column in there called Jersey Jack, and that's how the company got its name. I didn't. I hated Jersey Jack. I hated the name because I'm from Brooklyn. But Eddie Adler from Replay Magazine said, "Well, you live in Jersey, and you're Jersey Jack. And you're gonna like it." So I said, "Okay, I guess I like it." So we named the company. A lot of the customers says, "Call the company Jersey Jack." So that's what. We're so now I'm Jersey Jack. So that magazine cover was not just a month, that was a directory. That book sits on people's desks all year. And I can imagine some other people in the industry probably ripped the cover off. <laughs> um, we went to the London show, and there's some familiar Dutchy faces in uh, the picture on one side. And there's JP again. And, you know, yeah. yep. So, a lot, of, a lot of support from the beginning. Phil Palmer. Who's this guy? Jonathan? Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan was there all right, Jonathan. He's not in Rome. He's running around somewhere. We shipped the first game. And it seemed like forever. We shipped the first game on April 29th, 2013. And RNL carriers came, and I did a half-ass cartwheel in the front lawn like I used to do. Somebody, some customer that's a, a bone doctor called me up after one of my cartwheels, and he said, listen, you're gonna break your head, so don't do that anymore. <laughs> so I stopped doing that, I actually listened to the guy. I don't think I break my head, but I could do a cartwheel right now, in my dreams. So there was this guy, Pat Waller, right? And we rented a building from him. He had a building in Harvard, Illinois, in the middle of cow country, speaking of cows, and cornfields. And I rented the building from him for $2,000 a month, and we put our development office there, and everybody would go there to work. And one day there was a roof leak, and there was water dripping inside the building, and I went to the building, I got there about 10 o'clock, and the guys were there already, and there was a big bucket full of water. And I said, Where's the landlord? And I think Eric said to me, he's on the roof. <laughs> so I went outside and it wasn't a high building. It had a peak and there was Pat. I said, you know, Pat, you're, you're a really great pinball designer, but you're a really crappy roofer. <laughs> and we had a talk and uh, Pat joined the company on September 16, 2013. And um, you know, it's kind of been chronicled. I let him, I let him do what he wanted to do with Dialed In. You know, but first we had to finish The Hobbit. If anybody remembers when we revealed The Hobbit, it was kind of half-assed. Uh, they didn't give us all the assets because it was a secret. I learned something about licensing a live uh, license where you have a movie that hasn't been released yet. See, everybody knew what the Wizard of Oz, the witch looked like and everything like that. Nobody knew what Smout the Dragon looked like or other assets because they were protecting everything. So we released the game and it looked good until we saw the assets and we said, nah, we can't release that game. We had to do it over again. It's another million plus to redo it and a year later, The Hobbit was born. Who has The Hobbit? Do you love that game? Yeah, it's an amazing game. I, I remember in 2015, we visited your company yeah. in New Jersey, we drink coffee in your office. That's right. And 
you wait for the parts of Congress. That's right. And that's what I was here with in 2014. I had the Hobbit 10 years ago. So Pat created Dial In, Wooly Wonka, Toy Story 4, and Pat retired. He was at Pinball Expo, if anybody saw him there. Great guy. Um, December of 2013, the Smithsonian called us, the famous museum in, in uh, Washington, D.C. They had a Wizard of Oz display and they heard about our pinball machine and they wanted it on display. So the Wizard of Oz pinball machine was on display at the Smithsonian for two years straight on free play. And the game got the crap beat out of it. Thank goodness for uh, one of our customers who lived down that way. He used to go there almost every week and wax it and clean it and <laughs> change rubber rings and all kinds of stuff because all during the day, the people that went to the Smithsonian would play it, and all night the security guards would play it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we know who's going in the Smithsonian. So if you hear that, like, the, the ruby slippers are missing again, you'll know why. <laughs> the monkey's flying. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know what started happening? People that were famous, quote unquote, started buying our games and loving them. This is uh, Mitch Album, if anybody knows who that is, he's a really great author. And he wrote me a note, Christmas Eve he sent me one of his books that I got and said, to Jersey Jack, thanks for so many hours of fun in the pinball galaxy. Hope you like my work half as much as I do yours. And it's really humbling to hear that, you know, when people tell me how we've changed their life or how much they love our games or, uh, how much has become part of the family, and we're just trying to create some fun. That's what we're trying to do. I mean, bring some more smiles and happiness into this world that really needs it. A divided world, a divided country, and uh, pinball can bridge a big gap. It really can. I think that would bring us all together. We could all believe all kinds of different things, but we're all we're all pinball nuts, right? You know, you started seeing locations with the game and kids actually playing it, responding to the screen, responding to the colors, responding to the sound, responding to the mechanical action. You got a, a winged monkey bringing the ball up, you have a melting witch, you have a spinning house with legs coming out of it. You had a lot of stuff going on. And we had a lot of press come to the factory too. We had a lot of articles written about the company. We were on the front page of CNN Money one day. I got up in the morning and flipped my computer on and I went to CNN Money and I saw pictures of my factory on the front page of CNN Money. Um, industry, industry kind of recognition, it's always nice, but I don't really look for it. Uh, this was the design redo of The Hobbit. I don't really get into it because it's kind of painful, but the, the, point, the point of this is that we're not going to let something out of the building that's not right. If it's not fun, if it doesn't look right, you can look at Avatar, you can look at Elton John with microscope. Every detail of that game is thought of. Everything. Everything outside the game, everything inside the game, everything that went into the game. Um, and I believe it shows. You know, I believe it shows. Jersey Jack games are a lot different than anybody's games. You know, we don't have uh, a bull going through somebody's chin or, or cheek. In, in the artwork. We actually know where the bolts are and where the artwork is and all that kind of stuff. We pay attention to that stuff. I don't know, mismatched hardware. Um, we take a lot of time in looking at those details. We want to make playable artwork for you. That's what it is, it's playable artwork. And I have to say that JP and his team, as I listened to that presentation for an hour, I mean, our games would not be what they are without JP and the team. So thank you. I appreciate it. You all it. This was a picture of Slash, Love and Wizard of Oz. There were people saying, oh, Wizard of Oz is a girl game. No guys want Wizard of Oz. Well, this kind of proved that wrong. Slash has multiple Wizard of Oz games. He's been a good friend for about 18 years, customer, and we know uh, Guns and Roses. This picture of me as the mayor, Greg drew that of me, and I guess my hair, it still does that. I guess so. Uh, but I don't have a mustache, so maybe I'll have to grow that back. 
Guns N' Roses was a game I didn't want to do. There was already a Guns N' Roses game. I don't want to do another <coughs> remake game at the time. Slash calls me up and he invites me to a show in the Meadowlands. I go to the Meadowlands and I see the show and I say, holy shit, I gotta do Guns N' Roses game. You know, and the rest is history. Great game. You know, this is during, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is during COVID. This is October 6, 2020, the day after we, had, uh, we released the game. I went to the factory for the day and Slash was there for the day. And, um, and he's a character. He loves pinball. He loves pinball. He's a great guy. Does a lot of charity work um, uh, with us, too. And uh, we got everything on that. And, you know, the, the more assets I can get, you know, I'm responsible for licensing in the company. Other companies have five or six people, we just have me working part-time on licenses. But I need to get all the assets. I need video, I need audio, I need uh, cooperation from the person, maybe like Elton John did speech calls for us. You know, so we, we need buy-in. The, the more assets we get, the better game we make. And Slash really made sure that we got everything. Really did. The Godfather. It's not me, but it's me. I I wanted to do that game, and we did the game. And uh, God bless you, you know the truth. Uh, it was a lot of fun doing it. It really was. It was a lot of fun. Huh? And the game came out beautiful. I had to negotiate uh, for different characters that weren't part of the license originally. Paramount did not have Michael Corleone, uh, also known as Al Pacino. So I had to negotiate with, with his people to get him on this game, and I wasn't going to do a game without uh, Michael Corleone in the game. He's the godfather, right? So uh, I offered him, generously I offered him, my first offer was a pinball machine. And uh, his lawyer came back and said, it's been a long time since Al worked for pinball machines. <laughs> so I came up with some money, and uh, this is the first time his image and likeness has been on a consumer product. So that was a big deal. Eric did a great job on the game too. Here's my friend Steve Ritchie. April 1st, April Fool's Day, 2008, Monterey Bay. I was in California with my wife and uh, we met for lunch and uh, we were driving up to San Francisco and I think three bottles of wine later we made it to San Francisco about three in the morning. <laughs> Steve joins Jersey Jack Pinball. That was a that was a that was a great day. I think I think it was really something. You know, if you think about if you think about this, I was a street operator operating games in Brooklyn. You know, I had pinball machines on location, video games and all that stuff. And I would open up a box like when Funhouse came out. I would always get my games in box from the distributor. I wouldn't let the distributor open them because. I want to open the box. Not that open box one, really. I want to make sure nothing happened to the game before, right? So I would unbox games like, you know, Black Knight. I had a Black Knight in a location for like 15 years without moving it. I mean, it's ridiculous. A uh, Flash at a bowling alley in Brooklyn, uh, you know, like uh, Funhouse. Uh, I had a Whirlwind uh, Candy Star in Brooklyn, and the game said, the storm is coming, return to your home. And people ran out of the freaking place. <laughs> I saw it. They ran out. I just set the game up. What are you doing? I had a Stratavox in a, in a, at this place called Cafe Europa in, in Queens. And it was in the back room where people used to play cards. These old Italian guys used to go for their coffee and play the cards. Brish, brish. And the game would say, help me. Help me. Help me. Cops ran in the back. Cops were getting coffee. They heard the thing say, help me. They ran in the back. It was crazy. Gorgoth spoke. I mean, it was a different time. But my point is this. I never imagined that Pat Waller would come to work for my company. I never imagined that Steve Richard would come to work for my company. And, you know, Pat retired from Jersey Jack Pinball. And he made some great games with us. And Steve is making his second great game for Jersey Jack Pinball. I'm really proud of that. And I'm happy that we're able to do that. Steve's a good friend. You know, he wanted to do things with Elton John. 
that some other people in the building were skeptical about, like he had to make these little tiny coils and things to make Elton John's hands move, magnets, and turn his head, and I had people call me up, because I'm not at the factory every day, I'm in Jersey factories in, in Elk Grove Village. They call me up and say, listen, can you convince Steve, because I'm like the Steve Whisperer, apparently, can you convince Steve that he doesn't have to have the head turning and the hands moving? Uh, yeah, you know what, I'll talk to Steve. Okay. Oh, hello, Steve? Yeah, how's it going? Good? Yeah? Uh, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter, everything's fine. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't let anybody bother you. <laughs> that was it. You hire Steve Ritchie, you're hiring Michelangelo, you're not teaching him how to paint the Sistine Chapel. Leave him alone, give him a budget, and a little bit more, give him time, and a little bit more, and you get a game like Elton John. You don't get games like he was making before for somebody else. It didn't leave him alone. He's a lot happier, and uh, you get a better product. That's what I think, anyway. I'm happy about that. But yeah, the, the picture with me standing with the game, that was at Christie's in New York City, where we, one of the games we donated, that went for like $90,000 to benefit the AIDS. Elton John and AIDS Foundation, so that was nice. When I gave Steve the license to Elton John, he famously said, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, J JP wasn't the only one. Um, Steve didn't want to do it. Steve wanted to do like blowing crap up and airplanes and all kinds of stuff and cars racing off a mountain into the oblivion and all kinds of shit, whatever. You know, that's Steve, you know, and I can't blame him. But uh, next up was Elton John. I'm like, Steve, you're gonna do Elton John. Really? Yeah, he'll, he'll get to love it. And he did get to love it, because we had a licensed person that we had meetings with every other week and then every week. His, his name was Ben. And he made that so much fun to do that project. Elton John himself and his husband, David Furnish, you know, they looked at everything. And I could just imagine, uh, sadly I didn't see his face when the game was delivered because he wasn't home. But I could just imagine them playing that game. Maybe one of these days he'll actually tweet a picture. And one of the first things I sent to Steve was an old bumper cap that I had on, on my desk from Captain Fantastic. And I said, Steve, on the game somewhere you gotta talk to whoever, you know, Franchi, whoever was working on the game, Yossi, and incorporate that in the game. That's my, that's my homage to Captain Fantastic. And I got my Elton CE, and Steve wrote on it, Jack, great working with you on Elton, love you, Steve Ritchie. And he's a character. JP, look, <laughs> not cropped, <laughs> not cropped. I was here. Uh, I was here just in August, actually, uh, in Amsterdam, and uh, spent the nice day with JP. We went to the uh, the uh, uh, Anne Frank Museum, and we went to Van Gogh. We had a great time. Same day uh, I arrived, I went to Rotterdam. I finally made it to the Pinball Museum, and they do an amazing job there. Has everybody been to the Pinball Museum? Yeah. I have at least five times. Five times? Yes. Well, I'll get you a medal. Oh, I'll be honest. Or a chest to pin it on, one or the other. This is just uh, Pinball Expo a couple weeks ago. And of course, Martin's in the front leading the, leading the charge with Jonathan. It was, it was great. It was great to see the response of Avatar. We had, we had a great show, and we sold everything off the floor that we could sell. All the games are gone. This was uh, this is the chronological order of the game releases we had. We know Wizard of Oz, The Hobbit, even though it says He Hobbit, Battleman, Pirates, Willy Wonka, Guns N' Roses, Play Story 4, Godfather, Elton John, Avatar, Val, and Game 11. I'm going to tell you what that is. Okay. It's a pinball machine. This <laughs> is a white body. I'll give you that. No. Uh oh. Yeah, you got something out of it. Um, 
at my office, at my office at the at the factory, when I had an office there and I had a factory in Jersey, you could see my desk. Uh, you know, it's crowded with all kinds of tchotchkes that people give me or I trade things for or whatever. And there wouldn't be a week that went by that people wouldn't visit us, just drop in on us. And what I probably miss from that place that now happens in Oak Grove Village is that a lot of kids are really curious about pinball. We had schools, we had um, from high school and college courses. They, they teach science courses that you know pinball technology actually is relevant to, and they want to go study how a pinball machines works, you know, magnetics, geometry, all the things that are in pinball machines. So the future of pinball, I think it's I think it's in pretty good hands. Really, I feel pretty good about it. I, I see, you know, when I went to sh pinball shows 20 years ago, there was nobody at a show. Rob Burke said something to me last week, two weeks ago, that I felt strange about here and he said you know Jack if you didn't do what you did with Wizard of Oz we could have this show in a broom closet so that's Rob Burke saying that and I said yeah if I didn't start a company some other idiot would have started a company so that's kind of what I did do not go where the path may lead go instead where there is no path and leave the trail Yeah. So we've got a couple minutes for questions if anybody's got a question. Yes. When you have a question, please raise oh, the you. microphone is there because then everybody can hear you. Uh, will you be making any white bodies in the future or is that possible? It's possible. I mean, you know, I never say never. Possible. I mean, we're set up for it, certainly. So uh, could happen. Do you have more things in your Oh, office? wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait for myself. She asks if there are more seats in your office. Oh, right. Do you have more seats in your office? I remember our office in 2015, and you make more games in this year than your office uh, full of. Full of us. What more uh, things in the office? Oh, more, more stuff? I've been giving it away. I've been giving it away. Just like, it, it just keeps coming up. It just, I don't know, it multiplies. I don't know how sometimes. You know, if you're making a game and you have a part that turns out to be a reject, what it's part? garbage. But if I go like this, with, if, I, if I take that piece of garbage mm -hmm. and I go like this, now it's a collectible. <laughs> um, yes, you were the first to introduce uh, this place in, in machines. Every one in the industry took it over from you. Guilty as charged. Do you think there will be some new mechanic in the future that could also have such an effect upon the whole industry? Yeah, I think Elon Musk is going to put something in your brain <laughs> and you're going to be able to play pinball with your mind and you won't need flippers with your finger. <laughs> You can eat potato chips while you're playing pinball. That's what I think. It better be a good one. <laughs> How does it feel to be the man who single-handedly revived the pinball industry back in 2011 or 2013? I mean, uh, for more than a decade, the only pinball manufacturer was Stern Pinball. But uh, after you've made Wizard of Oz, more companies started uh, to sprout up. How does it feel to have such a massive impact on the industry that was once struggling to survive? You know, uh, that's what I was saying today. I just wanted to make some games. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't set out to be vilified or crucified or made a hero or all that stuff. It, it feels very humbling, is how it feels. Uh, I look back at it, and um, I'm very grateful and thankful for it. You know, I think a lot of people have come into the industry and they've started businesses and they're doing well, and I'm happy to see that. So uh, it makes me feel good. That's what it makes me feel good. Any further questions? Yeah. Uh, 
I will be see any more uh, non-licensed original theme games like that in the future? You, you might. <laughs> there, there, are, there, are, there are a couple things that are interesting to us that we're pursuing. Uh, you know, a lot of people feel that um, if it's not a license, you can't sell the game. Who has it dialed in? Okay. What do you what do you think about that game? I love it. Got me a jersey jacket. Okay. Right. You know, when I when I was an operator and I went to shows like the one I showed at 4 a.m. away, I remember going downstairs into the show and playing Pac-Man for the first time. And the Pac-Man, what kind of stupid name is that? I remember playing Donkey Kong. What kind of stupid name is that? But you know what? It stuck. It was a name. We called the game Dialed In. We could have called the game anything. Sunny day at the beach. And everybody went, everybody went nuts. Oh my God! Wait, wait, look what they call the game. I'm like, oh my God! I'm like, okay, well, I, I said we'll add Quantum City, the battle to save Quantum City. I got people calling me up like the next day and said, don't change the name of the game. Why? Well, I got used to it already. I love the phone game. Yeah, I mean, you know, pinball is a time is a snapshot of a period of time. Like you see old games, they have like cowboys playing cards, you know, or they have uh, space travel, like space mission games like that. Or they have actually people bowling. Who bowls? Mm -hmm. Nobody. Exactly. Well, I used to a lot of things. Right. But you know, you got bowling games and all that stuff. So that's what it is. It's dialed into snapshots. So. Yes? He turned the mic off. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I saw some pinball machines here that are out there, homebrews, uh, one heavy metal game, and the other one is like a space theme game. The guys are all wearing the same hats and shirts. What's the name of that game? Space Singularity. What is it? Space Singularity. Yeah, I played it. You know, I, I think today with 3D printers and technology and everybody interested, make the one game, make one game. You know, anybody can make one game in quotes. In you know, the guys that were doing the heavy metal game, they started in 2010. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a labor of love. Really, and maybe if you want to do it, there's so much resources online. There's guys on eBay and, and Facebook selling kits to, to make your own home game, board system and plywood and everything. You know, it's, yeah, make it easy. Anybody else? So my question to everybody is: You guys all having fun at this show? Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. You got a whole, you got a whole day tomorrow too, right? Yeah. Of course. You did a great job with the show. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you really good.